Uh, and this is a question for, uh, for either of you, but um, given, the, quest uh, given the, the fact, Joe, that uh, you mentioned God is at every moment, uh, has created, is sustaining, is holding together all of reality uh, at all time, uh, what, what does that mean for how we think about things like uh, the boundaries or the limits of scientific inquiry? Do you want me to go first? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Then I'll... So uh, I'll let Jerry correct me when I'm finished. Um, so I think the way that a scriptural worldview conceives of this is that um, sometimes we only have a, a, a two a two part or two layer worldview. We have creator and uh, creation. Um, I think there it's helpful to think about actually a, a third critical element in our world and life view it helps us understand the connection there, and that is God's word for creation, God's law for creation. And I think God's word for creation is that which is the boundary um, of uh, our understanding. So there is a certain, there is of course, uh, from a Christian standpoint, a very real limit to the possibility of human knowledge. And I think me, Jerry will be able to speak to the limits of the scientific method better than me, but from a philosophical standpoint, uh, we can analyze, we can describe, we can observe, but we don't get to the root of the meaning of those things or to the root of what holds all things together. From a biblical standpoint, that is the word of God. And God's law word uh, for creation, I think I mentioned the illustration of like a prism, God's word uh, is refracted into a multiplicity of different areas and different aspects, different areas of life have different laws which pertain to them. Um, and that's part of the, the complexity and the process of coming to an understanding of God's world. Um, it is complex, uh, but there is a very real limit. God's law word is the boundary of our understanding. It has to be God's revelation of himself. We can't lift ourselves up, up above creation beyond God's law for creation. God has to reveal and manifest himself to us. And I think the limits of scientific inquiry are the way in which um, creation reflexively responds to God's law for creation. So that consistency, the faithfulness of God in sustaining all things, then becomes what we call natural law or a, or a scientific law. When we repeat an instance and we have the same result over and over again, gravity was one of the illustrations that we've heard a couple of times, we call it a law. But we don't really know what gravity is. It isn't anything in and of itself. It's only something in relationship to everything else and actually ultimately in relationship to God. But Jerry may have deeper insight than me. Uh, not really, but I think it's good to stress that we should stress, science should stress that there is a lot of things we will never know, even with the tools of science. Mm -hmm. And a good example we talked about already is gravity. I think from that is, and this is, I'm not sure what the theologians say about this, but in essence, God is pushing everything toward everything else, and that's what we explain as gravity. We call laws laws because they're consistent, only because they're consistent, not because we understand them. We don't understand how gravity works, but it does work consistently. I don't know of any exceptions, and I'm not intending to go out, go out there to try to find some, but uh, the example is, of course, people jumping off buildings and hoping not to fall, but that's not going to happen, at least realistically. So therefore, gravity, because it's consistent, we call it a law, but all a law does is explain the consistencies or regularity, or every time you do it, it happens, idea. And the belief was for a long time, the God of the gaps, that science will fill those. And as science fill those, it will push God out of the universe. And indeed, science has filled a lot of those gaps. But in filling the gaps, invariably, they create more gaps. And so what we have is not a filling of the gaps ending to with no gaps, but we have a filling of the gaps creating more gaps. And many examples I could give you, for example, how does the genome work? How do we end up inheriting things? Well, we filled the gap by understanding how DNA works, how RNA works, how mRNA works, how transposons work, et cetera, which has created an awful lot more gaps. And so therefore, filling the gaps does not move God out, but it creates more room for God. 
And will we ever fill all the gaps? No. My perception is, is that as time goes on, we will be creating more and more gaps and thus more and more necessity for using God as an explanation. Theologians may not like to use God as an explanation, but indeed, you know, do, do we have a better explanation for many things? And therefore, Anna, be, we should be aware that indeed things may be explained by science filling a gap but realizing it likely, in many cases, will create more gaps, and so that shouldn't be a threat to our worldview. Uh, I come from the more scientific side of things, uh, medical training, um, and I found that when you look at the world around us, we can point to creation by an honest look at the evidence, but we wouldn't come up with a six-day creation from looking at the evidence. We need the Word of God to give us that clarity. And in your talk from philosophy in terms of definition of man, no wonder they're lost because they're abandoning the, the, the uh, cipher for determining who man is. In both of those situations, how then do you reach out to a world that has abandoned any kind of frame of reference to God's word that brings meaning to both philosophy and, and science? How do we reach out to that world uh, to bring the message of the gospel when for them, the gospel doesn't even make sense, like the, uh, like the Greeks. Uh, my response to that is probably among the most controversial things among the creationists is the whole problem of time and the six-day creation. Uh, partially because the other things there's no debate about. There's no debate that all the supposed vestigial organs are not vestigial. They have a good function, important function, in some cases a critical function. So, so many of these have been answered quite well. But the major problem area we have still is the AIDS question. The problem, each, the problem even young Earth creationists will admit is that there's good evidence for a young Earth creation and there's other areas that are problematic. The main one being the distance between the Earth and the stars, the planets, and so on. Uh, especially stars that are four and a half billion light years away, etc. And one way of, of dealing with this is the fact that when creation occurred, before creation, there was nothing, and God created matter, energy, time, and space. And so before space, there was no distance between us and the other galaxies. The galaxies were created as well as space created at the same time. And you might say, well, that's very epistemological or whatever, but that is the same explanation that scientists give, except we have a creator to begin it, and they have chance to begin it. I taught astronomy several times at the university, and a uh, number of lectures in the, the tapes that I had, basically they said the same thing, that in the beginning was nothing, and from nothing arose everything, and from nothing arose everything via the Big Bang. So the Big Bang created space, matter, energy, and time. And so they have the same issue we do. They have the same conclusion we do. The difference is, is we postulate God did it. They postulate, well, it just happened. And I have a number of lectures given by prominent astronomers who basically say it just happened. We don't know why, but we know it did. It must have because here we are. So therefore, the Big Bang created time, space, matter, and energy. So in many ways, the same problem exists no matter what viewpoint you take, but we take the viewpoint God, they take the viewpoint, well, it just happened. And when people ask, well, how did it happen? What caused it to happen? They don't know. And they admit they don't know. And they state, the evolutionists state, this is a area we may never answer. And creationists, we answer it by, well, God did it. And they say, well, that just pushes it back one step. Well, if you're aware of, if you're aware of Richard Dawkins and so on, well, God did it, but then who made God? And of course, we end up then with the infinite regression where if we find out, well, the, the turtles made God, well, who made the turtles? Well, the sea made the turtles, well, who made the sea? So we end up with what they call the infinite, aggression, uh, infinite progression backwards. And I have to admit, this is one area where philosophy and has to step in, and us as scientists, we can't. And so you philosophers out there, this is your domain, so good luck. So I, I, would, I would just add that I think, um, I'm not a scientist, but I, I, uh, but I do think that um, there isn't a thoroughly established cosmology out there that the 
uh, experts will agree. And I think the Big Bang model is in some degree of scientific trouble. I read an article even 15 years ago on, uh, uh, in the New Scientist uh, on a whole raft of scientists challenging um, the Big Bang model. I think that there's an interesting, there's a whole interesting problem around the whole idea of time. Because since, especially since Einstein, we've, we've talked about a space-time continuum. Um, but I think that actually uh, unnecessarily limits time to a couple of aspects of creation. To um, uh, as though as though creation really consists of space and time. We talk about the space-time continuum, um, but actually, time in many respects functions in different ways in different aspects of our lives. Uh, Augustine wrestled with the problem of time. In I mean, what we're talking about here is physical time. Yeah. Um, but Augustine wrestled with the problem of time in his Confessions about what is time. If he says, if somebody. Uh, doesn't, if, I, if nobody asks me, I know, but as soon as somebody asks me what it is, I can't tell you. Um, so, you know, we're all familiar with expressions like, you know, the watch pot never boils. Um, there's our subjective experience of time. Um, there's the way we try and measure physical time. Um, but then there's elements, the way we think about time historically, we think about time periods. So actually, if you look at uh, we don't, we, so when we think about, uh, when we divide up the history of science or the history of philosophy, we think about time there, we experience time, we think about time in a very, very different way than simply physical time. So I think one of the things to do is explore the richness of, in a certain sense, the, everything is, to be human is to be in time. The cosmos in that sense is time, um, and every aspect of our life functions within time. Um, the experience of duration is one aspect of that, but it's not the only aspect. Um, with respect to how we um, communicate to the non-believer, look, I think, and I think Jerry, I hope he doesn't mind calling you Jerry. That's fine. Um, it's either <laughs> easier than Dr. Bergman. Um, we, we need to show how when you try and reduce man to any one of these things, you destroy him and you destroy meaning. So. Um, Look, the, part of the issue is that some of the questions that the scientists are even ask, ask themselves are not meaningful unless creation is meaning. I mean, they are already human beings by posing the questions. The notion, for example, that there is truth that transcends my physico-chemical event here. And, and so... If thought is just a physical chemical process, as many of those views of man try and reduce it to, then you've got one chemical accident going on in your brain and I've got another chemical accident going on in mine. Well, neither of those chemical accidents is either true or false. They're just chemical accidents. So the very idea of truth, of, the, of, of actually saying that we can discover meaning, which is what science fundamentally is about, we can discover laws, we can argue about what is true or false, is presupposing a universe that is full of meaning. It's not a, cha it's not a chaos, it's a cosmos. So uh, unless, there is, unless there is a design plan which relates all the facts of human experience together that we are able to discover, all human experience from a philosophical point of view is absurd. And the existentialist is, is right, stare at the abyss and despair and maybe just kill yourself, because it doesn't mean anything. There is no meaning in anything. Um, and actually, Western culture um, has seen, and will continue to, to, to see, a decline in its interest in many of the sciences, and a decline in educational standards, as we abandon the idea that this, this world, this cosmos is creation, it has meaning, we can discover that meaning, there, are, there is law for creation, and we can unpick it, we can understand it. Um, when you deny that, you actually start to dissolve the very nature of man. I mean, what kind of a future does Western culture have mm -hmm. when we can't, even, we can't even agree that there are two sexes, male and female, and that biology does have something to say about your identity? I mean, that is, the to that is utterly unscientific, it's anti-scientific, fundamentally, and yet our whole culture is pushing it. Even the medical profession, in parts, not all of it, in part, is pushing these ideas. Because that's actually a, uh, it's a fundamentally ideological idea. 
So you will actually undermine the practice of the sciences. There's a reason that modern science emerged in, as some historians would say, the lap of Christendom, because only Christendom held to a view of the world that allowed science itself to arise. So the way you engage the non-believer in this is to fundamentally show them that if what they were saying is true, there is no meaning in anything that they are saying. You can't even formulate the questions. There is no meaning there to be discovered. There is no truth. So why are we even arguing about it? You are a bundle of sensations. That's all it is. There is nothing more to reality. You're a bundle of electrical, you're a chemical, you're an atomic accident, you're a chemical event. You're a bundle of sensations. That's all there is to it. And nothing else can be said. Uh, and so the task of apologetics is not to say, well, we're going to win everybody to Jesus. Not a single one of my arguments can win anybody to Jesus. The Holy Spirit can win people to Christ by the instrumentality of my arguments. But in the end, we have to, to challenge them that the basis of truth, to have a foundation for truth, to have a foundation for science, to have meaning, presupposes the creator God. It presupposes that the universe is meaning. Uh, and so the non-believer is always borrowing from my worldview. I mean, this is the force of the apologetic argument of a truly scriptural apologetic, is that the non-believer must always be taking the resources of a biblical worldview in order to make their arguments. So in order to, to actually um, object to the God of Scripture, in some respect, you are already having to presuppose the reality of the God of Scripture, that there are laws of thought, of logic, that there is truth, that there is meaning, and that we can discern it. Otherwise, there's no point in having a debate. I once said at the beginning of a debate on the existence of God that by showing up, my opponent had already conceded. Because by turning up to a debate, you're saying that truth is something that transcends your brain and my brain function. It, and that it's something that these people who are listening to our discussion can either say, yes, that's true, or yes, that isn't true, or no, that's not true. So the very idea of debate presupposes of the objectivity of truth, which requires the creator God of Scripture. So we have to just pull the rug out from underneath these people and say, how can you invoke logical thought when on the atheist worldview, on the materialist worldview, there is no such thing as a law of logic? There are no abstract entities that are laws that, are, that hold and bind creation. There is only the flux of atoms. So that's, I think, where we begin. Just one point when we look at the fluid of gender, that there is no, not two genders, there's what, 34 now, I guess, genders? 72. So, seven, so to Facebook. It's going up high, okay. Uh, concern that with that is that they need to, instead of coming up with these ideas, which I'm not sure how they come up with them, they need to look at the reality. They're ignoring reality, and I'll give you one yeah. quick example. We assume that the difference between males and females is one chromosome, X and a Y. Got two Ys, got a female, got an X and Y, you have a male. End of story. But we now know that beyond that, that these chromosomes can turn on or off many thousands of other genes on the rest. And so male would then turn off a lot of genes and turn on, by epigenetics, other genes. Females do the opposite. And therefore, we now know that males and females have many thousands of differences, as any man who's ever dated a woman knows. <laughs> and, and vice versa. And we cannot really, the sexes cannot get along until they understand, my wife has to know, to understand that I'm a male, I do not see the world the way she does. And she does not see the world the way I do. And when I mention this to students, I have yet a single complaint. They typically smile and say, right on, I need to tell that to my boyfriend or my girlfriend. We are very, very different, and to understand the sexes, we have to understand the differences, and I will not behave in many ways like a female, or, nor should I expect my wife to behave, behave like a male because we see the world in very different ways, very similar ways, in other ways as well, but we still, we are genetically, there are thousands of differences between us and we need to understand that to be able to interact and therefore society to work. And therefore, I see a lot of these new fangled ideas are without an empirical mm -hmm. basis and they are just foolish and cause a lot of harm. Anybody disagree with me? Any gals out there? Is that true what I said? 
I see a lot of smiles when I mention it. To understand a male, you've got to understand there are many, many genetic differences that you cannot change. And I can go through many, many examples, but one of my most favorite is, is that women are far more perceptive at reading people than males are. And study after study has shown that when you try to read people's emotions, feelings, etc., females are far better than males at reading these. The theory evolutionists say is, well, because the females had to take care of the babies and they had to be perceptive, otherwise their baby would die. So it had to be more perceptive to be a mother to take care of children. Uh, and whether that's true or false, I won't go into, but the fact is, is that females are much better at not only reading people, but also at being aware of things like my wife can see a piece of dust three, you know, three rooms away on my clothes, and I don't even notice it until she points it out. So females are much more aware of small minutia things than men are. And to understand that, then she understands that there's not anything wrong with me not being able to see it. And I understand that she is going to see things that I don't see very readily. Well, I think you might have answered most of it there, but uh, I think a related issue to the nature of man is the nature of the university. Um, and I think it's interesting uh, that you talk about what a cosmos is and the centrality of meaning, um, because I don't think it's by accident that the university was born in Western Christianity, where we had the framework to make sense of that. Um, and with it, something like the soul. Um, I have this quote by Aquinas, which I think is really uh, intriguing, but he says, since a soul can know all things, in a way it is all things, and thus it is possible for the completeness of the universe to exist in one thing. Um, so I was just wondering if you could speak to um, the effects of this reductionistic view of man, um, the removal of the soul to the uh, nature and vocation of the university and how the Christian um, tradition can really support people like Enlightenment thinkers like Pinker and others who want to reclaim this high view of reason in the university um, in, in, in the midst of that. Do you want to speak to that? Or? Yeah, briefly, I, you bring up universities. I feel a major problem today in universities is they are ignoring reality like this gender business is one of many examples. And we end up with fads in universities and how they start, I'm not sure, but we end up with, and there's many accounts of this, of people who disagree with certain ideas that are pervaded in universities and they end up quitting or losing their job or whatever. And it's not just creationists, it's others as well. And universities seem to have a mind of their own and they are basically going against reality and also the problem results from this is intolerance. As at least in the United States, we see riots at University of California, Berkeley, where huge amounts of damage is done, primarily because they do not want certain ideas to be entertained. And of course, to me, a university, the whole point is to entertain different ideas and to rationally interact with each other to be able to understand reality better. And that's been a problem, at least in some areas recently. The, the, um, the word university, as you probably know, means unity and diversity. So the idea of the university was that it would be a place in terms of uh, God as creator, and in most cases in Western Europe and Christ, Christ as creator and redeemer. Um, the motto of Oxford, for example, is the Lord is my light and my salvation. Um, the idea was that there would be a place where the diversity of meaning finds its unity right, in God. We, what we have today are multiversities, they're not universities. And, the, and that is the result of what we were saying earlier, which is once you have denied the ground and foundation of meaning, you only have meanings. If, if, if the world is not, if creation is not meaning in terms, of what, in terms of what God has created it to be, then man must invent the meaning for himself. So of course they're not interested in reality. The university increasingly is not interested in reality. I was at, at Oxford just a few weeks ago for the Wilberforce Academy, and um, I was being told by a professor from the University of Bristol that, uh, who was part of the faculty uh, with me there that um, 
recently a leading professor at Oxford had published a major paper um, about uh, the British uh, Empire and had dared to suggest in this paper, uh, given his historical research, that there were some positive elements to what happened in India with the British. He's a historian, so he's talking about uh, the establishment of various institutions, parliamentary democracy, a certain uh, uh, infrastructure. These are things that Indian scholars have observed and written favorably about for several generations now. 100 college professors from the University of Oxford went apoplectic and wrote a letter to the head of the college uh, calling for the dismissal of this professor from his job, from his role, because he suggested that the imperial life of Britain was not a uniformly negative story in every part of the world, which would seem to be absolutely obvious to any sane individual. But they don't care about sanity because history and reality and science increasingly don't matter. If God is not the creator who defines meaning and we are thinking God's thoughts after him, I mean, it's the Cavendish Physics Laboratory in Cambridge has written over uh, the top of the, uh, the, the library there as you go in, uh, I forget the exact nature of the inscription now, but it's about contemplating the Lord in all of his works. If we are not discovering God's meaning, then we are inventing a meaning of our own. You become the creator of reality. You become the definer of reality. But not just, that's not just one definition. If you've got the right to redefine the reality, then so is everybody else in your class. So there might be 50 genders or 72 genders, or, and, and, and so we've even got it in Canada now. Statues of the founders of Canadian society and culture being torn down and pulled down. We don't want contact with reality and real history if it doesn't fit with our narrative. So the modern university is a place for barbarians. <laughs> That's what we are, right? It only, takes, it only takes one generation to create a barbarian who is utterly ignorant and disconnected from their history. And that's what we're dealing with with these rioting students and who want to tear the college down and even professors who want to destroy other professors because they dare to include a couple of pages on one or two redeeming features of the British Empire. The whole thing is absurd, but it's the logical outworking of a worldview that denies the creator God of Scripture. Very good. Uh, I just have a question a little, little different than some of the other ones, but back sort of to the more Darwinian aspect of um, maybe not Darwin himself, but at least like a Darwinian uh, racial theory and how, uh, how that has had impact or negative impact on both in, in and out of the church. So I see a couple of examples maybe you could speak to um, where like clearly outside the church as far as, um, you know, genocide and slavery and things like that, which you mentioned a lot. Um, and maybe even within the church in terms of uh, uh, sort of a, a view of, of a race of Israel or di di um, and then maybe how to articulate sort of looking back beyond when this sort of idea of race began, how to articulate a more biblical version of racial theory mm -hmm. in, in those two or different areas as well. I can mention race is not a biological concept, it's a sociological concept. And there is a friend of mine I just met last week, I got the nerve to ask him to pose for a picture. He was a black man who became white. And he literally was black, beautiful pictures of a black man, and he became white. Now, I knew the, I, the problem was vitiligo. He ended up losing his pigment. And usually it splotches, so it's pretty obvious what happened. But with him, he lost most of his pigment on his hands, his feet, his face, etc. And so he tells friends that he spent the first half of his life as a black man, and now he's <laughs> trying to spend the last half as a white man. And he has noticed just skin color. That's the only change. And he has noticed that people react to him quite differently because of the skin color change. And he's not only white, but he has almost no pigment, so he's whiter than I am. And as a result of this change, simply the color I, it's making a great story because there are accounts of this you read every now and then, and I d doubted it. And I was mentioning this at one time, and he came up to me and he says, well, you know, I used to be a black man. 
I looked at him and said, you know, okay, what's the joke? Because <laughs> you know, uh, he, is, he is not, does not look like a black man at all. He looks like a white man. And then he pulled a picture out of his wallet and he showed me and I says, yeah, clearly a black man has become a white man simply on one change and that is skin color. As a result of vitiligo, which is a basically an autoimmune disorder related to the production of pigment in the skin. Actually, that's an interesting anecdote because uh, when I was, um, again, on this most recent trip to Oxford, I had a guy that I'd asked to come and speak on economics. And um, he uh, looked as though he just climbed off of the, he looked like he was Portuguese maybe and had just climbed off of a sunbed as well. Very, very dark skinned. And um, I said to him, have you, uh, have you just come back from vacation? He said, oh no, I have a condition. Where the, where the pigment, I don't know what it's called, I can't remember what he called it, where um, actually you, you keep getting darker. Um, and uh, he said it's interesting how, same as interesting how people responded to him thinking he was from the Mediterranean now, not from the UK. But I think that it's very important to, the first thing Jerry said is very significant. In the Bible, there's no such thing as races. There's the human race, that's it. There is only one race. Now there are people groups, because as we spread out across the earth and our genes in different parts of the world are coding for different characteristics because populations have separated out. Um, but there is only one race and that's the human race. And isn't the church, isn't the communion table, isn't what Paul says about the gospel so profound here that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor three, barbarian or Scythian, we are one uh, in Christ. Paul makes the argument that we're all from one blood in Acts 17, speaks about the unity of the human race. So we have to be um, very alert to the way in which this whole idea of racism, which is a humanistic concept, is used to manipulate and control people and divide the world up into oppressed and oppressors and so forth. It's a Marxist I idea, uh, it's a culturally Marxist idea anyway, and it's related to all kinds of other ways of slicing people up into different groups, especially different victim groups, um, and uh, trying to put people at war with one another. The Christian life in the Christian church is meant to be a picture of God bringing people together in unity around the Lord's table. One of the things I love about our church, Westminster in Toronto, is that we are fully representative of the totality of what Toronto actually looks like. Um, if you, live some, if you live right in the boonies, obviously your church can't look like that. But you know, if it's in Toronto, I think increasingly it should. We should be a picture of what it means to see God's people uh, coming together. I've never been a fan of, of monocultural church environments where we say, well, this is that kind of church and this is this sort of church. We should as much as possible, possible I think, be trying to be together as a picture for the world of what our unity in Christ actually looks like. And we should be celebrating the diversity that's actually there amongst us, the different things that we all bring to the table in the rich diversity that God has allowed in his appointing the place and boundaries of our habitation, which uh, Paul talks about. So the goal is not to make the world England. I, I grant that some of my forebears, you know, thought that that's what missionary activity should look like. They did some wonderful things. They were brave people, but part of it was not, the goal is not make the world monocultural. Uh, make everything look the same. You know, the, the goal is that in each of our the different groups in which we find ourselves, the gospel would come to full expression. And we need that kind of diversity uh, to, to uh, show us where we're lacking. I think we don't seem to have anybody else stood at the microphone. Is there, are we done? Calvin's going to be the last question and then we're going to wrap up. Thank you, Michael. I just wanted to make a comment on the yeah. race thing, Joe, because you're so right in a biblical worldview, there can be no such thing as racism It's only the evolutionary worldview that supports racism. Because if there's different races evolving at different rates, then you can have actual racism. Yeah. So I just wanted to pull the plug because there is a book over there on the book table called One Race, One Blood. Carl Wieland? This is yeah. Very, very it's a great book. That's a great book to get. Um, and, you know, when you've got powerful movements like Black Lives Matter and so forth, I, mean, I wrote an article on that, one of the contradictions in that very idea. We heard it from Jerry today. Black Lives Matter does, 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 don't matter to most of the people who champion it. Because if, it, if they did, 40 or 50% of the black population wouldn't be being aborted. So these are, these are ways in which we, which are political manipulations to divide people. 
We should address injustice, which is a totally different thing altogether. If there is injustice in the way black people are dealt with by the courts in certain parts of the United States, then that should be addressed because God requires that justice be shown no partiality. So we address injustice, but we don't hang it on the peg of something, a humanistic concept, an evolutionary concept called racism. All right, why don't we stand as we close and why don't we sing um, Fairest Lord Jesus and then we are all dismissed.